Hey everybody, thanks for watching our ongoing series with wildfires in America. As you know, over the last couple of days, we've been talking to experts across the country about our wildfire predicament and how we battle these wildfires year after year. Joining me now is a biologist from the University of Central Florida, Brent Salisbury. And we're gonna be talking about the season in a little bit more detail. First, Brent, thanks for stopping in and talking with us today. Yeah, thanks for allowing me to join in and share my thoughts and opinions about wildfires. Absolutely. So I, I want to get right to it. So, you know, usually this is the time of the year that wildfire season winds down. It's kind of like hurricane season. It's November. Things climatologically are a little less active, but that's not the case in the western U.S. They are still battling many wildfires. In fact, you just came back from the August complex fires in California. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I went up to, uh, uh, as a private contractor, I was an engine boss, I went up to the August uh, fires, which um, are actually three um, separate incident management teams. I was on the northeast division of that fire. I spent two weeks there on a deployment as an engine boss, and uh, yeah, the fire now is a 95% contained uh, almost uh, two and a half months later, so it's, it's still burning in some parts. Um, and yeah, what, what historically would have been um, that area of Shasta County and Mendocino County would have received snow and um, a lot more rain than they would have. It would have put the fire out naturally, but um, the firefighting teams are still uh, uh, fighting those fires and uh, um, it's still going on, 95% contained. So is it unusual in your experience that we're still dealing with wildfires in the month of November? As you mentioned, you know, cold fronts are much more frequent and the snow starts to fall, rain becomes more frequent and you get into the wetter monsoon season. But is this unusual in your experience? Yeah, um, I started my career in 2007 with CAL FIRE um, as a firefighter and I went to school in, in Humboldt State with forestry. Um, and some old uh, firefighters told me there was old wise tale that um, the two four six rule. So, the towards Northern California, two months uh, out of the year were severe fire seasons. And as you move further south to Southern California, that season lasted six months. So that two four six rule 25 years ago doesn't really apply today. Um, we're seeing the fire seasons increase drastically to more like six, eight, and 10, 11 months out of the year. Wow. Or Southern California can burn up to nine to 11 months out of the year. That's incredible. So I understand uh, some of the research that I've done, uh, that I've done is, is that there's an invasive beetle that I guess eats the forests out there. Do you know anything about that? Or can you tell us some of the reasons why there's been so much uh, wildfires this year? Yeah. the. Most of the beetles are actually natural. They're naturally occurring. Um, they're native beetles that you know decompose rotten wood or living wood um, naturally for thousands of years. But there are some cases of uh, Asian longhorn beetles um, imported from China, either from furniture or wood, that is wreaking more havoc. But a lot of the issues of the native beetles, uh, like Dendroctinus or Ips, are a result of fire management and the fuel loading problem, which everybody's been talking about fuels. Um, when we talk about fields, we're talking about the, uh, the living and the dead um, vegetation out in the forest floor, like the leaves, the bark, the, tw the sticks. Um, those are fields and um, that could be standing or on the ground. So because of the, the past 75 years of improper uh, forest management, whether it's lack of logging, lack of prescribed burning or wildfires, um, because, you know, back in the... 1910 to about the 1980s, um, fire suppression was very common. We weren't doing any prescribed burns at that time period. So a lot of the fuels increased and then the bark beetles are coming in and doing what they do, reproducing and eating that wood or killing the living um, trees out there. And they're becoming snags and not living anymore. And that's just uh, added hazard to firefighters now. So it makes, uh, when we do have a wildfire, it makes it more challenging to stop them because you're having the increased fuel, the dead trees, and the hazards. Well, and I would imagine too, I talked a little bit about this in my piece yesterday, that uh, that not only do we have these beetles out in the western part of the country, in particular California, but we're in a La Nina season, and that typically means drier winters. Is that been your experience? 
Yeah, I mean, we've had El Nino seasons, and we've had La Nina seasons, um, so it's difficult to predict. I mean, meteorology do predict the season. They can do that pretty well. Um, but, yeah, that having a dry winter does not help um, the wildfire issues, especially when you have fires in August and September that we had this year, and they're occurring until November, maybe even December in Southern California. So a La Nina definitely affects um, – fire severity versus an El Nino year. Right, where you, where it's wetter. And I was talking to one of the experts this week that there is a concern because it's going to be so dry, even even in the central and the southeastern part of the U.S. because of La Nina, that there could be a secondary wildfire season in April. Are you, Have you heard about that or do you have any thoughts on that? I have not heard about that, but I was just remembering, I think uh, I was also in the, um, not the Gatlinburg fire, but when uh, Georgia and North Carolina had their fire season in 2016, that was also a, a weird year for that part of the, the state um, because they haven't had fire like that in 30, 40 years. And I think that mm-hmm. was also a La Nina year where it was a dry or um, dry fall season and a mm-hmm. winter season. And then those fires started in November and lasted until December. Yeah, I remember those. Those were I. Re- it was so heartbreaking to see, and such an unusual uh, part of the country to deal with that. Which actually kind of leads me to my next question, because I know out west those are much larger, and they take up many more acres across the eastern part of the country. But the yeah. eastern part of the country, where we are in Florida, in particular, uh, we get a wildfire season just like the lower 48 does. But why is there a difference in the severity and the scope of western wildfires versus eastern wildfires? If you could nail that down to something without it being too long-winded and ecological and kind of going over everybody's head um so fire uh florida is a fire dependent um state as well as like georgia and mississippi alabama um we actually need fire in our forest one to five years every one to five years of fire it's called the fire return interval um and much of the united states broad needs also has fire dependent ecosystems, but theirs are longer. Like California, you only need uh, fire every five to 15 years in California. Um, so that changes the, um, the interval or the frequency of fire. Um, but historically we have data that goes back um, several hundred years through fire scars and written records that fire was very common all over the United States, especially Florida. Well, that's really, there, there's so many differences, I guess, in comparisons you could draw between the two, you know, the, of all the fires along the country, the ones in, out west grabbed the headlines. And that was another question that I had. You know, when there's a threatening hurricane, it seems like it leads the news all across all networks, local, national. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, you know, the wildfires really have to be intense and burn hundreds or tens of thousands of acres to get any national news somebody loses their house you know that you know gets the media's attention you know when neighborhoods are affected for sure well i was what i was going to ask you is do you think there is a good infrastructure in place to battle fires you know with the hurricanes we have the hurricane center everyone knows the national hurricane center and they have you know everyone uh, they have their twitter facebook and I know we have that with fi- the, the fire division as well, but I, I do think there, if we could ever do a social science component to this, that there maybe isn't as, as solid messaging with the wildfires. Do you see that when if you're comparing natural hazard to natural hazard? So I feel like with the cooperation with the National Weather Service, the, you know, the amount of data that they uh, produce helps fire managers and firefighters across the country. Um, that data, like red flag warnings, Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys are so accurate on your time, on your, your data and the ranges that we were expected. And it's almost identical when we do calculate weather on the ground. That's huge for us um, for predictive services. And we, we typically, and you know this better than I do, like one week before a weather phenomenon like that happens, you guys have pretty accurate data. And we issue red right. flag warnings, or you guys do. And um, on the ground, we implement that. and it gives us such an oasis of awareness that, hey, we're gonna be getting this weather phenomenon that's gonna be happening, that fire intensity is gonna pick up, and we work with um, meteorologists and fire behavior analysts on the ground for the incidents that give us warning. They can actually predict fire spread, flame lengths, um, pretty accurately with the weather that we're getting. 
Um, but yeah, they're um, they're working on more research um, about fire spread um, through the Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, um, that will offer some better predictive services. Um, so I feel like we're working pretty closely with all the agencies, the Weather Service, um, the U.S. Forest Service, to get good data out there to firefighters and the general public as well. well that's good. That's good to hear because I. I, you know, I did talk to several firefighters this week, and there was, uh, you, you, not concern, but you, the, I think some of the firefighters that I talked to think that there is, you know, with some messaging, it's oftentimes difficult to convey to the public the risk that they're at. I know with yeah. hurricanes, uh, w when we're trying to warn people to evacuate or explain the risks to get them to heed the warnings is really hard, and I would imagine it's the same with fires. You know, people don't ever want to leave their homes, understandably, unless they think they're in imminent danger. Yeah, but I, I would think talking about social media, I think that's approved a lot in the last you know ten years with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, here at EF, we partner with the the emergency management team and the police department here when we do control burns or have wildfires on campus at the university. Mm -hmm. um, we have this program called UCF Alert, where everybody in the vicinity of UCF, students, staff, and community gets alerts about. Um, a wildfire or any presence of fire in the area and I know that's being implemented all over every emergency management um, team across the country the cities and counties have it um, so there's a lot of good data and um, social media programs like that I know next door uh -huh. is a, a frequent program that's used a lot to alert but we need something the, the UCF alert is more instantaneous where if you have a fire at 2 a.m. in the morning, it'll alert you on your phone and hopefully wake you up because uh, there are a lot of fires, like the Tubbs fire in 2017. I think uh, I think it was like 44 people passed away on that, at mm -hmm. that fire. It was very devastating because it happened at 2 a.m., so they mm -hmm. weren't ready for it when the, you know, it was a power line fire. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need, we need more data and software like that definitely there's also room of improvements for it well that was you lead me to my my next question so how do you see us as a community at large fighting fires in the future you know you mentioned social media and, and I do I agree with you I think it on any natural hazard social media Twitter in particular does a service to letting people know quickly but not everybody has Twitter not everyone's on Instagram or Facebook especially yeah. uh, the younger generation is usually on TikTok or twitch or something else but how do you see us uh, moving forward in the next 10, 15 years to fight fires more effectively or get the messaging out so that, uh, you know, we do have more success stories than, than, than not? Yeah, that's a really big, it's a big topic. Um, well, we talked about resilience. Um, you know, it's gonna take everybody's effort, not just the state and federal agencies to become more resilient to wildfires in the future. Um, it's going to come down to the local landowner and the homeowners that are living near the forested areas. Um, I mean, I think everybody knows what the word firewise means. We need to have more firewise communities. Um, you know, taking you know, taking an individual homeowner, if they can each year take efforts to reduce the threats around their house for their safety and then for firefighter safety, they'll be more resilient for fires in the future. Mm -hmm. um, on a community scale, we need to have better uh, zoning laws that kind of either prevent building in hazardous areas that are known for frequent fires, mm -hmm. or they need to become more firewise as a community as, as a whole. And whether that's complete fuels reduction around their communities. I know Cal Fire in the, the state of Florida, we have the Florida Forest Service, they do a weed abatement programs where they require landowners to clear around their land before fire season. So that's gonna, you're gonna see a future in, in that pickup. Uh, we just need landowners to be more responsible because ultimately the firefighters and the first responders are putting their lives on risk to protect houses. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the Absolutely. houses are already protected to begin with, that's the first step. Um, and Is then, one of the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just wanted to ask you when you're talking about, you know, homeowners being more responsible, I read, and maybe you can tell me this is true, that if you have a hose 
that's it greatly reduces your risk of losing your fire because you know you do see videos during wildfire outbreaks people on their roofs you know spraying down their roofs or spraying down the sides of their home does that really work it's not recommended because obviously the homeowner has to be there to do it and that mm -hmm. adds more challenges because you know the firefighter the engine boss whoever the incident commander makes the decision to stay or leave the house um, including, you know, one of our responsibilities, our first responsibility is protecting life, but we're protecting our own life and then also the residents. So it adds right. the complications. So I don't recommend staying behind to fight your own, you know, fight a fire for your own house. But there are steps like if, if you make um, water readily accessible to firefighters, that helps. I've seen a lot of signs that say there's a swimming pool that you could use or a well that you can use, and it's a big sign. So right when you roll up with a fire truck, you can see that and you think in your head that's my water source that I can use to protect their house right and that helps firefighters as well but um there are cases where you can set up sprinklers and leave them on because you know at that point water is a you know you got to have water to fight fire you can turn the sprinklers on the house and then if you could leave and go to a safety zone or evacuation um, that would definitely help for, um, in some cases, but That's great. Having, having the resident actually stay there while the wildfires occurring isn't recommended. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't remember the context of the article, but that's, yeah. you know, some, you know, leave your sprinkler alarm is a great, is a great tip. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you before we got too far along here, was there anything from the August complex fires or any fires to you in the last year or two or recent history that stuck out to you. We did a big series on Paradise you know, two years ago, and, yeah, and I was just curious if you had any stories you could share with us. Um, the uh, you know, thing about the August complex fires is they started in August from a, a series of uh, lightning strikes, which, you know, are naturally occurring in California. Um, you know, that's been occurring for thousands of years, but what happened was the, the the drought of California, the climate change, the you know the 75 years of forest management in those areas, all those individual fires came together um, relatively quickly. I, you know, I read that you know in 24 hours you had several miles of uh, fire spread, which is kind of unheard of wow. for fire management. So um, that's what made the August complex the biggest in California history. It's it's a little over one million acres. Wow. Just from individual lightning strikes that occurred in August. So that was kind of a interesting fire to be on, to be on the, the largest fire. Um, was a new thing for me. I've never been on a, a million acre fire. They're That's calling it. It's incredible. Not a, they're not calling them mega fires. They're calling them giga fires now. Wow. I was doing some research uh, and the story I had that aired yesterday, we talked a little bit about, a little bit about the big fire of 1910 where 3 million acres burned and I and I think like two days something insane yeah uh, but I know this year alone when I was doing my research that Colorado got their three largest fires in their history this year you know yep. the East Troublesome and the um, oh, I'm forgetting the other two but 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 they had you know these three fires that were the largest in the state's history it's just amazing I just wanted to ask you as we wrap things up here are there any things from this season that stick out in your mind that were unusual to you in the August fire or that you know any trends that you see that are you know that are concerning for you that we should know about or or at the public at large can do to help our part do our part um one thing i do want to bring up that i saw in our fire we uh we had a on the northeast side of the august complex we had a fire in 2017 um it was called the buck fire and uh, we actually use that to our advantage of stopping the growth or we saw a reduction in fire spread just because of that fire that occurred in 2017. I just want to reiterate how beneficial sometimes fires can be. You know, mm -hmm. we have data that says that control fires and some forest fires are actually beneficial and we use that to our advantage. So we saw that fire scar from the, the buck fire um, occur and it actually slowed down the uh, August fire quite a bit and allowed firefighters to kind of reassessed and move resources around because um, we didn't need to put out that fire because we knew that from 2017 it was going to slow or stop it and it actually did so we're starting to see that now and I hope to see more um, prescribed burns or controlled burns happen in the future 
because um, that's a clear testament of the effectiveness of uh, forest management and how you know fighting fire with fire can actually help. Yeah. Well, that that's a, ter- a terrific point. And one of the last things I just wanted to to kind of you know get a feel from you is, do you think that uh, in, tw- in the year 2020 with you know COVID and there's so many risks inherently that firefighters have anyways you you know you're you guys are in the fire line directly you're inhaling all of that smoke and from what i understand you can't wear the tactical gear that the uh the the firefighters that are fighting structure fires in big cities do because it's just not it's not feasible yep so is there is there um a way to keep firefighters you know at retention so they can i from what i understand firefighters when they're fighting these wildfires just can't stay on these uh, fires for more than a few weeks. It's exhausting. You guys have 16 hour days from what I understand. Physically, yeah. it's very challenging. Yeah, definitely. It definitely takes years to build up to that, that stress, mental stress, physical stress. Um, we have a really good physical training program where we're constantly doing pack testing and workout and diet. The, the incident provides good meals that supply the, the calories needed for the job. And then, like you said, you're allowed to work 21 days, and then the incident makes you take two rest days, rest and recovery days, to kind of get back into it. And, you know, I was only there for, you know, 14 days, and then I flew back to Florida. But some of the firefighters I talked to were there for almost two months after those rest days. So it's a definitely, it's a family. There's a lot of stress that adds to your family and your Mm -hmm. wife, your husband's at home. Um, So, yeah, it's something very challenging that firefighters have to work with um, and they have to look out for their own well-being you know if you know that you're getting uh, mentally drained or physically drained you can let incident personnel know that hey I need some time off to recover um, mm-hmm. and we could that's why they bring in national resources we had crews from Israel Canada Mexico Australia yeah. come and help California because there were so few firefighters left Wow, that's a, I I didn't know that that's a, a great story in itself. I, I you know I think a lot of those stories aren't told off so often because as you said it's physically and mentally draining for the firefighters. So you, there's yeah. only you know a certain amount of time that you can fight these fires until you just your, your body's got to take a break. And one yeah. of the firefighters I talked to in Oregon was saying what he wished that we could do moving forward as a country is you know devo- devote more resources to hire more firefighters. And I, you know, I don't know how that would look from a business standpoint, but I know that it's, you know, it's got to be a challenge when there's only a finite amount of time that you physically can battle these things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's another uh, topic to bring up, you know, adding more firefighters would help. But uh, one thing that I would like to see um, is more legislation bills that correct forest management, whether it's fields reduction, forestry um, projects, or prescribed burning. And we talked about the, you know, the, the wildland urban interface and what landowners and homeowners can do. But um, imagine the state of California, you know, I got numbers up here that says approximately 80,000 to 125,000 acres are treated per year in California by controlled fire. I'd like to see those numbers go up to, you know, a million acres. In in the yeah. state of Florida, we're averaging around 1.5 to 2 million acres treated between federal and state and private oh. landowners. So that's almost tenfold difference in acreage totals for a state that twice the size of Florida. Yeah. So I think by having an active legislation that protects firefighters gives more funding for programs like prescribed fire or forest management you know it's going to take a couple of years but you will see 10 20 years down the road the size of fire the intensity of fire will you know greatly go down um, because we're now taking the steps to get back to where we were before 1910 um, with those wildfires and we kind of got into a, a wildfire suppression policy um, because of that, but we're, you know, through science, through legislation, we're getting back to where we should be naturally. That's a, that's amazing to me, that statistic that, like you said, Florida is so much smaller in size than California, and there's there's so much more resources devoted yeah. to prevention. Is there a reason why that is? 
Uh, yeah, so, you know, we had a bad fire season. Florida is fire dependent, like we said, like you said, but um, 1998 was really the last major um, fire um, season that we had where thousands of homes were destroyed, and we had a lot of good individuals on the ground through fire councils. Um, the state of Florida has the Florida Forest Service that wrote state legislation um, that protects prescribed burning um, for private landowners. And we still use that same legislation that was created after the 1998 fire season. And I predict that something like this will happen. Is it's happening right now in California, where we need to have better um, statues that protect prescribed burning and allows it, um, because there's so much red tape and regulations mm -hmm. in California through the air quality emissions that yes. pre prevent control fires. Because they already have built-in problems with smog, right? I mean, they, they, Florida is yeah. a peninsula. We, we get a better breeze, and I, I imagine smoke dispersion is easier here in Florida yeah, than we, it is in California. We have two large bodies of water on each side right. of us. Our air, you know, every 24 hours is moving. But coming from California, you have valleys. You know, you can have smoke and um, smog that will sit for several weeks. So it is challenging to do these control burns, but it's not impossible. Um, we're doing them right now. You know, uh, we have 1.5 to 2 million acres a year. We're doing them at UCF. Um, we're a small um, campus. We only have 800 acres of natural lands, but we have 65,000 students on campus. And then we have about 20,000 residents around us in communities. And we're doing controlled burns because we've had on campus wildfires um, in 2007, we had about 20 acres of wildfires on campus, and that's really when our program first started as a university. Is um, they were trying to figure out what we can do differently in the future, and it was controlled burns and proper management of the forest. So our burn team got together and we started doing these controlled burns at UCF, and really it's it's been a kind of a model for the whole state and the country on. You can still have a campus and urbanization and a forest that's healthy and thriving and is more resilient for the future. Well, that's great to know. I didn't know that about UCF either. You know, as, as yeah. you know, my radar's here in Orlando too. And then so glad to know that the, the largest university or one of the largest in the state here is doing their part to, to give back to the state at large. So that's really great to know. Hey, Brent, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else before we wrap up that you think that we should talk about this current season or seasons in the future? Um, I just wanted to encourage, uh, you know, private landowners, um, residential homeowners and state and federal agencies just to continue working together. You know, the state of Florida through the fire council and all the agencies and the uh, mutual aid agreements that we've created, we're helping a lot of agencies out. Um, and I hope to see that kind of expand through all the states um, regarding fire, where we have more firewise communities, because um, fire ultimately doesn't care about what patch you wear on your shoulder. Um, if we can all help each other out with resources and um, putting more good fire on the ground, we're going to make a huge difference in the future. So that's one thing I encourage anybody listening just to you know, get involved with uh, fire councils, firewise communities, um, public burn associations, and uh, just make a difference in the, the forest and the landscape. Absolutely. Well, I think what you and the, and the folks at UCF are doing to, as you said, you, you know, you live in an urban, urban community, but yet you're also helping thrive the forest in the central Florida area. I think that's such a great story in and of itself so I, I hope that uh, if we have some folks that are with other universities around the country that happen to watch this they'll be inspired to uh, maybe reach out to you directly brent and, and and talk about the model that is going on at ucf and i just want to thank you again brent salisbury a biologist from the university of central florida joining us today to talk a little bit more about wildfires and what we can do as a community to uh, battle them in the future again brent thank you so much for talking to me today yeah thank you for having me and uh yeah Thank you for all you guys do for us on the ground. Absolutely. All right, you guys, that's going to do it. We hope you guys have enjoyed our series. You can catch the, all four parts of the series in the My Radar app. It's in the My Radar media layer. We also have it on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. So we encourage you guys to go back and uh, take a look at our four-part series on wildfires in America. Again, Brent, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Stay safe.
follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.